Attention! This makes absolutely no sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sanders Facts. Hello, everybody. What is going on? Welcome into the latest edition of the Xander's Facts podcast. I am, of course, the aforementioned Xander. It is episode 108 of the podcast here on Thursday, June 8th, 2023. Thank you all so much for listening. And listen, I know we usually do our podcasts on Wednesdays, but we're doing it on Thursday this week for a very big reason which I had no idea was going to happen. But we're talking about soccer this week. And if you don't know, if you haven't learned, you um, may be living under a rock. If you say so. Wednesday, Lionel Messi, the GOAT, one of the greatest soccer players in the history of the world, the greatest active player, announced, ladies and gentlemen, he is leaving PSG in Paris to play for Inter Miami in Miami, Florida, in MLS, in the United States. Not just a major day for soccer worldwide, but definitely in the United States. And we've got that to talk about. We've got so much more to talk about with our Xander's Fact soccer analyst, Emma Adams, who graciously Join the podcast this week to talk about all the stuff that's going on in soccer. We're going to get to all of that in just a second. But before we do, just wanted to remind you all that if you like the Zaders Facts podcast, if you think you're going to like all the facts on this week's edition, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, episode 108, rate and review the podcast, and check us out on all the socials. You got Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I'm on all those at Zaders Facts. That is Xander with a Z. And most importantly, remember to tell all your friends. We like to call it around here. Spread the facts. Xander's Facts Podcast. Tell all your friends about the podcast, about the newsletter. Xander's Weekend Facts. It is a recap of the week's top headlines. It comes out every Sunday morning. It's free to sign up. Do so in the link in this episode's description. And check out the Xander's Facts link tree because it has all the Xander's Facts links that you need for the podcast, for the newsletter, for all the facts. Xander's Facts link tree, which is also linked in this episode's description. We got a lot of facts this week. Well over an hour's worth of facts to share with y'all regarding soccer. We talked about the end of the Premier League season. The UEFA Champions League final is on Saturday. We previewed that, gave you our fact-filled predictions. We talked about all the transfer news, including Messi, but there's also other players. And of course, we talked about the United States men's national team because they're in action next week. Talked about the transfer news that's going on with our U.S. players. That's a lot of facts. We had a lot of stuff to talk about on this week's podcast, so let's just get straight to it. We are talking soccer here at the end of the European club season with our Xander's Facts soccer analyst, Emma Adams, as the Xander's Facts podcast continues. Xander's Facts. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Xander's Facts podcast, episode 108. Y'all, this is like maybe the most excited I've ever been recording a podcast. Because as you all know, we're talking about soccer this week. We got a lot of stuff to talk about in the world of soccer. The European club season's wrapping up. Transfers are going on. Champions League final. We got to ra- recap the Premier League season. We got to talk about the U.S. men's national team because they're playing next week. Oh my gosh, all topped off by the big one, which was announced today, Wednesday, June 7th, the day we're recording this podcast. Lionel Messi is going to Miami. He's not going to Saudi Arabia or Spain or Liverpool. Right, Emma Adams? He's going to, he's going to MLS. By the way, Emma Adams is our Xander's Facts soccer guru and she is joining the podcast again to yes. talk about everything that's going on in the world of soccer Emma adams how's it going good thank you for having me i'm excited to be back and get into it who isn't excited you know what today right now i think these past this past year and these next few years Emma adams i believe it is a great time to be a soccer fan in america wouldn't you agree I think Ronaldo and Saudi Arabia would say otherwise. 
What do you? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. What are you talking about? Did you not read his comment the other day? You said in the next five years, the Saudi Arabia League will be the best. Will be like up there with all the leagues, and everyone's going to Saudi Arabia. Only Messi's coming to the MLS. Messi, the biggest name in the world. Ronaldo and Benzema are both. Benzema is old. They're Ronaldo all old. is old. They're all old. You can't do anything. We're going to talk about the Saudi Arabian League because it's a joke. Who wants to live in Saudi Arabia? You know what? You couldn't drive there, so why don't you quit talking? Okay. Whoops. You know what? It is a great time to be a soccer fan in America. Messi's coming. World Cup in three years. Copa America next year. The U.S. men's national team is the best it's ever been. Listen, y'all. We got a lot of stuff to talk about in the world of soccer. We are going to, we've got Premier League seasons wrapping up, as I said. Champions League finals this Saturday. We got to preview the Champions League final. We got to talk about all the transfer stuff, including Messi, some other names, and all the U.S. stuff that's going on, too. And we have the Women's World Cup, which is later this summer. U.S. are going to get their fifth star, if you can believe it. I mean, it's already a known fact, but, you know. Gash facts. Why don't we just get started, though, because we've got, a, we got some big stuff to talk about. But let's just get started by talking about... Emma Adams' favorite league, the Premier League, which whose season wrapped up a week and a half ago, Manchester City, as predicted, by the way, by both of us, last year in, Jan- in July, on this podcast, Manchester City won their seventh Premier League championship, ninth in the top division in England with 89 points. But let me tell you something, Emma Adams, it was not a certainty that they were going to win this year, because Arsenal were leading the league for 248 days, which is like 93% of the season. And then, you know what? Arteta. He fumbled. No. It was bad. What happened? I mean, they were just, they were doing so well. And then, you know. I think it's the pressure that got to them. They can't, when you have someone like City on your back and you're a club that hasn't normally been this good in the past while Arsenal have, yeah Arsenal have they normally finish like anytime I thought of Arsenal they normally finish fifth like they were consistently like good but not good enough you know so but this year they really they had they played great but I think and they just got tired and when it came down to it when you put them up against Manchester City you're not gonna you're not gonna win not many people are so actually like in the game they played against manchester city that was like it was a couple months ago but everybody was like this is the title decider and you really don't get those in the premier league because they don't have playoffs Mm-mm. but that happened and manchester city kind of blew them away so you're like uh. four to one but listen arsenal were the first this was the first time this year that arsenal reached 50 points at the halfway point of the premier league season like, not even the 2003-04 team that didn't lose a game in the entire season did that. And they still fumbled the bag. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, if you... they were, The inconsistency is almost, like, comedic. Because you... <laughs> the last... We're going to take the last five games, right? So you beat Chelsea. Arsenal beat Chelsea. Great. Well, it's not hard. They beat Newcastle. That's a good game. Mm-hmm. That's two Champions League sides. You lose to Brighton. And not only do you lose to Brighton, but it's like 3 0. And it's like, okay, but like Brighton are good, but like still, that shouldn't happen if you're about to win the league. And then you lose to Nottingham Forest. Like that was just like the real, ooh, like wow. Tricky trees. And then at the end, you beat Wolves 5 0. Like all is good. What didn't happened? matter though. It didn't matter. No, they tried. They gave it their all. They will contend next season, but they may have a new player next year yes. who may may I just help them out. Something today. What? The uh, conference Europa Conference League. West Ham. Declan Rice. Um, no, I'm not talking about Declan Rice. I'm talking about Declan Rice. They want. No, Declan. they want Very him. Good. He's not really that. Yeah. You know. What are you talking about? We'll talk about him in a little bit on this podcast when we talk about U.S. men's national team. But Arsenal kind of fumbled the bag. City, of course, were like, all right, thank you very much. 
and they won the league. They also won the FA Cup last Saturday against Manchester United. They scored in the first 13 seconds of the game. Whoa. And so they've done the double. But, as we're going to talk about in a bit, they can do the treble. If they win in Saturday's Champions League final, which we're going to preview in a second. But we've also, in the Premier League, there's four Champions League spots for next year. Manchester United and Newcastle also clinched Champions League spots. I don't know if y'all remember, but <laughs> beginning of the season, I did my top 20 Premier League clubs, which have changed considerably. Newcastle was 20th because of the oil money. Money is money. At the end of the day, they use that money. So, <laughs> well, for like, I feel like we've realized that just putting throwing money at the problem, like Chelsea's done, isn't going to really help you. Like, no. they're actually really good. Yeah. And so they're going to the Champions League next year. But one team that didn't make the Champions League is Emma Adams's favorite, Liverpool. They clinched Europa League, though. I mean, there's another team that didn't clinch anything. That is, is a team that you like. Who? Chelsea. I don't like Chelsea. No way. No, you no, did. no. You no, did. no, no. I don't. I hate them with a passion, actually. Well, I think considering that Liverpool were mid table through this halfway through the season, clinching anything, even like being Champions League debate, like being in the mix was a was good for how the season was shaking up. But obviously everyone was disappointed. It it was inconsistent like Arsenal. It was just back and forth and next oh. season there'll be a lot to build on. Well, you say like Arsenal, but Arsenal finished a lot higher. But if you look about like the points in the second half of the season, Arsenal were great, and then they dropped a bunch. Like for us, it was like we were bad, and then we went. It was it eight games undefeated at the end, like a little run. But like, there's a there's a difference, you know. It was just inconsistent in play. But why were they so bad to start the season? Mm. They lost to Leeds, bud. At home, everyone. I, I don't know if it was a mix of tired and pressure, but I mean, it was at the end of the day, it's defense. Like it was the only. Like Allison deserves everything of the year. He he's Echo. like everything of the year is is him. Like he's the only reason we did okay. But it wasn't the midfield and the defense really. The people like Trent, Virgil. Virgil, Others? Virgil slept midway through the season. He was a little tired, but... Well, he had the World Cup, you know. Decided to take it all out against the U.S. in that uh, round of 16, but you know. Honestly, Virgil took it all out when he knocked that Argentina guy over in the World Cup. <laughs> that was funny. That made me like him so much. But I just think... I don't know. We've got a lot of work to do, but obviously we finished on more of an upward slope so no oh, no okay Jurgen might leave but you know okay you're <laughs> not gonna leave i uh, might come he might come over across the pod so then you've got the other team that made the europa league or actually there's three teams that made europa league brighton you say brighton was you know they lost three no but brighton did really well this year they made europa brighton league they great. got six they were a surprise they have great players looking at some of their like attacking Forces. I don't. I don't know. Watching them play is really fun. McAllister. Welcome home. <laughs> well, shut up. We'll <laughs> talk about him. Then you've got West Ham, who finished fourteenth, but they're going to the Europa League because on Wednesday, which you know we had to record this podcast after the Conference League final. Of course, we had to talk about it. But West Ham beat Fiorentina. They scored in the ninetieth minute to win the Conference League title. So they're going to Europa League even though they finished 14th in the Premier League this year. So you got three teams going to Europa League from England. And then there's Aston Villa. Aston Villa finished 7th. Remember Aston Villa had Stevie G? As their and manager. They, and they Who fired might, him. There was rumor he would go to Leeds, but I don't know. Or Leicester. <laughs> well, that's the championship, so. <laughs> but they fired him, and they got so much better. They're, they're playing in Europe next year. And then you've got... Eighth place, Tottenham, Spurs. I know you feel really bad about them. Nope. And the thing is, like, I can't even be hopeful about this one because they're just going to get worse next season. 
Like they're gonna lose Harry Kane, gone. Oh, uh, really? They're gonna, they could lose. They're gonna lose people, and I don't. I don't see any hope. Their team was around Kane, and without him, I feel like it's mm. they could they could barely win with him, and now it's like. Well, they have a new manager. They fired whoever the. They and no one knows who he is. Oh, the Celtic manager, though. Yes. Who? So then, then let's go down to twelfth, bud. That was the team you think I like for some reason. I don't. You liked, you liked the last ten. I liked Chelsea last time we talked on this podcast. I don't anymore. Chelsea. They finished twelfth, forty-four points. They had three managers this year, all of whom treated the best player on the squad with blatant disrespect. Why would you do this to me? And they said, "You know what? Let's bring in this boy." From a war torn country, Ukraine, Mikhailo Mudrik. And you know what? He turned out to be, for what was it, a hundred million dollars? Awful. Garbage. Straight garbage. Arsenal were trying to get him, and Todd Bowley said, Oh, well, you know what? Arsenal are bidding like 40 million, whatever. A hundred million! <laughs> And you know what? Arsenal were like, thank goodness you did that, bro. Because this man, who was known as Butterfly Boy on this podcast, was terrible. He was trash. Not just on the field, but off the field. He left his country while they're fighting Russia to go to England and start shouting the N-word in convertibles and taking videos of people's butt cracks in jibs and getting called out by the goat joey swole so you know what i am sick of chelsea and butterfly boy because he's terrible they're terrible they chose him over pooley who helped them win the champions league i'm done that's it me and chelsea are no longer a thing i'm sorry when were it wow look at this so sorry to tell you the last time Chelsea finished in the bottom half of the league was 95-96. <laughs> and you know what? They they had Thomas Tuchel. They fired him. Deservedly so, by the way. Everybody's like, they should never have fired Thomas Tuchel. They lost to Dynamo Zagreb in Croatia. You ever heard of that team? No. No one's yes. ever heard of that team. <laughs> well, you may have, but no one else has ever heard of that team. They lost to them. They were not playing well. They lost 3-0 to Leeds. Medford Messi had a no-look goal. Medford mm -hmm. Messi! Brendan Aaron said they had to get rid of him. They hired Graham Potter. And Graham Potter, as we know, is a good coach because he coached Brighton. Now, obviously, what um, Deserby did with Brighton was better than what Potter did with Brighton this year. But he's, we know he's a really good coach. And he floundered. Then they bring in Super Frank. Frank Lampard back. Super Frank Lampard. Who they fired to get Thomas Tuchel. And then they won the Champions League. But he got fired from Everton because he was terrible. And then they do worse, I think. Like, they did even worse with him as interim manager. It's not a manager problem. Thomas Tuchel's a really good manager. Graham Potter's a really good manager. I don't know about Super Frank. Super Frank managed not to do the James Bond, the 007. Uh, you know what? Yeah, they got that draw. Let me tell you. Didn't it lose is. his first seven games. It Almost is. lost his first seven games. But you know what? I, it's not a manager problem. It's not a player problem because a lot of those players still there won the Champions League. It's an organization problem. I love Todd Bowley, you know, because he went to William and Mary here in my great Commonwealth of Virginia. He's an American, but you know what? He has done a god awful job at Chelsea. I mean, holy cow! He's he said he stepped back from the club, not you know running things. Thankfully, they uh, but they need some work. Their new manager, Mauricio Pochettino, who got Spurs to the Champions League final, by the way. When did he leave Spurs? Uh, well, he got fired because he was not doing well. Yeah, that was the point I was going to make there. <laughs> and he went to PSG. PSG. PSG, it's a rule, by the way. They cannot keep a manager for more than two seasons. 
That's the rule at DSG. They just fired, they just got rid of their manager after a year. Thomas Tuchel was gone after a year. Pochettino was gone after like a year or two. I don't... <laughs> they like to keep it fresh. That Qatar money, let me tell you. Or I don't know, some oil money. I don't know, but Pochettino's not really... Unless they change the organization, it's not really going to help them because you know what? They're going to lose Mason Mount. They're going to lose Pooley. I don't know. Okay. N'Golo Conte. Conte, they're going to lose him. Conte may be what, their best player, except he just gets injured. Reese James can't stay healthy. All these players, like, let me tell you. Don't they want a new goalie, too? Yeah, they have Keppa. They have Mendy. They don't like either of them, even though they paid a lot of money to get him. I know. Ugh. Matt Turner actually is available if you want him, so he's back up for Arsenal. Huh. I just, they're just terrible. And you know what? I'm done with them. Officially done with Chelsea. Never again. Because Pulisic is leaving. Thank goodness he's going to leave. Where's he going to go? I don't know. We'll figure that Juventus? out. You know Someone what? said Juventus. I read that. Juventus, Milan. Oh, Joe Felix, hold on. We didn't realize how Chelsea lost Joe Felix. Hey, you know what? I love Joao. Joe. That was so bad. Literally, everyone was like, we have Joe Felix. We're going to win the league. And then all of a sudden, he didn't stay from his loan. What punishment did Joe have to, to deserve to get sent to Chelsea? Well, he wasn't doing well at Atletico. So, but um, you know what? He needs to come on this podcast and tell us what he puts in his hair because I'd like to get some. Let me tell you, that man, majestic. We'll call him. <laughs> we'll call him. I just, can we not talk about them anymore? They're just, I'm so sick of them. They're so terrible. Let's go to the relegation battle, though. Gosh, or I, other stuff I don't want to talk about. Relegation battle. Everton won. They beat Bournemouth 1-0, final day of the season. And so for the second straight year, Everton barely escaped relegation. Just, just barely. I mean, listen, bud. You, you're our rivals with Everton. Yes, is Liverpool. Cross town. Like, it, the stadiums are like a mile away. Yeah, They're super close. So, I mean, I don't know. What do you think about Everton just, like, barely hanging on? Like, what would you have done if they got relegated? Would you have celebrated? I don't know. There's always, like, that... It's like you get such bragging rights. Like, you could literally say... Like, they could say anything, and you're like, yeah, but you got relegated. <laughs> yeah, but you're literally not in the Premier League. Uh, but, you're playing Huddersfield. Yeah, but... At the same time, it's like, well, then there's no Merseyside Derby. Then there's no, like, I don't know. It makes the league less interesting when your rival isn't even in it. So, but oh. as they, it's great. They're not doing that well right now for us. Because as long as they're, we get to play them and we know we're going to win. Like, okay, great. But it, it it's a little, like, sad. They do have some good players on there and, like, it's sad to see them fall so so low when they shouldn't be. But we'll see what happens next year. Another team I felt that way that I just felt utterly disappointed in was Leicester. Oh, well, they did get relegated, so. They have James Madison. They had Jamie Vardy. They had, like, so many. I guess they're older now, but not, not even Madison's, like, in his 20s. But my one of my favorite presidents, I mean. Not funny. They, the, stop, the, what, they won the league seven years ago, I think it was, right? 2016, I think. So seven years, yeah. And so many of the players, you know, Lester really made a, a name for themselves, and the same players are on the team, and they got relegated. And it's sad to see. You know what's also, well, actually, hold on, I, just go back to Everton for a second. I read something that they, MSP Sports Capital, which is from New York, is investing a lot of money in Everton now. So they're going to get a jolt of money. So they might not be bad for long. That jolt of money is probably going to their stadium that they can't afford anymore. That's, like, <laughs> that's well, that's probably true. I, Another sad thing, though, actually, I'm not sad, I'm happy now, is Leeds. If y'all remember my top 20 Premier League clubs, guess who was number one? Leeds. They were Leeds United States at the time. And you know what, bud? They fired Jesse Marsh. Was that a good idea? Should they have done that? 
No. No, they shouldn't. And I have the stats to back it up, too. Because if y'all remember back in February, it, well, listen, it wasn't going so well, okay? They um, were not in the relegation zone, but they were bottom half. After, listen, first half of the season, they beat Chelsea 3-0. They beat Liverpool at Anfield. What was that the first time Virgil van Dijk lost in the league at Anfield? This is true. Like, they were doing really well. And then, you know what? Stuff happens. But they were doing fine. They fired Jesse Marsh. And immediately, you look at the graphs, the stats, immediately, they drop off. Because we know their defense was championship level. Barely. The worst the Premier League saw at the end of the season. They were hot garbage. And what Jesse Marsh tried to do is try to play panic soccer. They like to call it panic football. Panic soccer, basically. Which is just like a score as many goals as you can. Which they were doing sometimes, and they won games that way. It was defend, f- defend from the front by scoring so much. Yes. And that works sometimes. It's a prime example of when things are bad, it can always be worse. Because... <laughs> Things were bad with Jesse Marsh, but it can always be worse than it was worse when he was gone. So Because the players, like the players they had on defense, just... I just... And you know what? You know who their best player was this season? Maybe their best player. Rodrigo was pretty good. Tyler Adams was really good, too. You know him? Weston McKinney was their best player. Weston McKinney didn't do that well, let me tell you. No, they kind of missed out. They didn't... Their transfers didn't hit good either, so that's kind of what did them in. They didn't really focus on defense, which they kind of should have. Tyler Adams was their best player, though. He was fourth in the Premier League in tackles, and he played 24 games. He missed 14 games. He was still fourth in the Premier League. And you know what? He's not staying at Leeds. He's going he's gonna to go back to the Premier League. Yeah, 100%. And so he got injured like a little bit after Jesse Marsh got fired, and that that was it for Leeds. I mean, they were just... Med- even Medford Messi couldn't save him. Medford Messi, listen, he might have to stay in the championship. I mean, he kind of... He's a scrawny thing. He needs to hit the gym. A scrawny thing. Med- I love Medford Messi, though. And you know what? Medford Messi Jr. plays... Or Messi- Medford Messi the second. His brother Paxton plays for Frankfurt. Good to know. Just, they fire Marsh in February. They hire Javi Gracchia. For, well, I don't know. I don't know if his name is Gracia or Gracia. I just don't understand if the English were pronouncing his name wrong, like they pronounce Martinez Martinez, which is <laughs> not how you pronounce Martinez. So I'm not sure what his last name is. They don't do well. They have to fire him. They bring in everybody's like, oh my gosh, they're not getting relegated now. Big Sam. Because you know what? Big Sam always saves Why clubs not? from relegation, except for the last time before, because they got relegated. And then they get relegated again because people, they didn't realize Jesse Marsh was like trying to put a cover on that defense of like, they're bad, bro. And he knew it. And he was trying to, you know, not expose them as much. And then the other two managers come in and it's just like, oh my gosh, they're terrible. The managers for the rele- like the relegation battle teams were kind of stacked. Like you had Sam Allardyce, Everton had Dean Smith. Also good. Then Leicester. Who was Leicester and, and Southampton? Southampton didn't really matter. I mean, come on. No. <laughs> Southampton were the other team that got relegated. They kind of weren't really in it. No, though. Dean Smith is Leicester's. Who's Everton? So. It's some guy who did a really good job. Sa- Sean Deitch. Sean Deitch, that's who. Yeah. He did Dean a pretty Smith, good job. Sean Deitch and Allardyce. They're all good. Yeah, but Jesse Marsh is better than them all. And you know what? Let me the stats. Jesse Marsh was manager for 20 games. Leeds played another 18 without him. They they had 34 goals against them when Marsh was manager. That's not very good. They had 44 without them. Without him. That's terrible. Expected goals per game under Marsh 1.4 without him 1.1. Expected points in the league. The league rank with Marsh 12th in the league. Which is, you know, not that great. But without him, 17th. Points per game. Under Marsh, 0.9, which is not that great. Without him, 0.72. 
Points versus the big six clubs with Marsh. Six. Without him, one. That's a lot of numbers. Like last year. You remember last year, everybody, all the Leeds fans were like, how could they fire Marcelo Bielsa? He's a club legend. They, they were going to get relegated. Jesse Marsh <laughs> saved them from relegation last year. They had no points against the big six clubs last year. In the first half of the season last year, they had, this year they had six. Yeah. Why? I just, that's what really ticks me off about English soccer. They do not hold on to their managers. They have to make these irrational decisions. Could you imagine in the NBA, like it happened for like the first time this year, a team fired their coach and they immediately hired a new one. That doesn't happen in American sports, like ever. And in European soccer, it happens all the time. I mean, look at Chelsea. They're on like their third manager of the season. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pochettino technically is their fourth. But <laughs> yeah. Oh, listen, I just can't. Leeds. They fired, they sabotaged Adams. They made him get injured in practice. I know it deep down in my heart. Know it. They fired Marsh. They're no longer Leeds United. Their fans have been horrible to us Americans. So I'm, you know what? Good riddance. I'm sick of you, Leeds United. Number 20 on my now favorite Premier League clubs. Mm. Sorry. That's blasphemy. So there's, yeah. <laughs> so the teams are relegated. The teams that got promoted, though. As we wrap up our Premier League talk, which has gone on way too long, Burnley, who are managed by Vincent Company, Man City legend, Sheffield, and Luton. Luton Town, bud, let me tell y'all. So, little thing, last year's promotion playoff, which features the three through six teams in the championship, the EFL championship, the second tier of soccer in England, who tried to get up. So in the final last year, Nottingham Forest took down Huddersfield Town to advance the Premier League. U.S. men's national team goalkeeper Ethan Horvath was a member of Nottingham Forest. He didn't play in the final, though, but he was a member in that playoff final last year. He was loaned to Luton Town for this season, and you know what? He ended up starting in the promotion playoff final, which went to penalties. And you know what? Luton won. So two straight years, my legend. I'll have to see the stats on whether he saved the penalties or they... No, well, mind tricks. You know the mind tricks. You know how it goes. Horvath has been in the playoff final. He's won it for two straight years. Nice fact. I love that, man, by the way. If y'all remember the 2021 Nations League, he saved that penalty against Mexico. That man is a U.S. men's national team legend, and he's like 22 years old. And if reports are correct, Luton have the option to buy him. Permanently. So it's possible he could be their starting Premier League keeper next year at Kenilworth Road, which I don't know if y'all have seen the pictures, but the 10,000 10, seat stadium, like a, like a college basketball arena is bigger than Kenilworth Road, and it's surrounded by homes. I think that's going to be intimidating in a way for away fans. Oh yeah, you gotta you gotta go through somebody's yard, somebody's yeah. house to get in. <laughs> yeah. So they're they're gonna have to do a lot of improvements though this summer to be ready for the EPL. Like they're saying, like the first few games might have to be on the road for them because they're gonna have to do like a lot of work. It's rough. We're done with the Premier League though. We're gonna preview the UEFA Champions League final, which takes place on Saturday though, between Manchester City from England and Italy's Internazionale also known as Inter Milan. It is the first ever competitive competition between these two sides, and Adams. Did you know that? I didn't. They've only played twice before in friendlies that took place over 10 years ago. July 31st, 2010, Inter won 3-0 in Baltimore. Oh, no. The next year, exactly one year later, July 31st, 2011, in Dublin, Ireland, Man City won 3-0. It's a fact. Wow. Can you believe that? That's like a fact you're not going to hear anywhere else. No. To be honest. Last year's champ. Let's just talk about these two teams real quick, though, because last year's champions were Real Madrid. What a final that was last year. I remember that final where they banned all the Liverpool fans. That was pretty cool. That was so sad. They all got their money back. All the fans got, like, abused. That was a tragedy. Imagine if, like, you're playing and, like, you know your family's in the crowd and, like, the supporters are being abused. Okay. 
So Real Madrid were taken down by Manchester City in the semifinals. It was a rematch of last year's semifinal matchup, if y'all remember, because last year, Real Madrid's Rodrigo scored two late goals, like the 90th minute and the 91st minute, to force the second leg of the semifinal in extra time. Karim Benzema, we'll talk about him a little bit in a minute, he hit a penalty in extra time to advance to the final. And then this year, after there was a 1-1 draw in the first leg of the Bernabeu, City, they crushed Madrid in the return leg in Manchester 4-0. Yeah. Behind two first half goals from Bernardo Silva, then they had two second half goals from Akanji and Alvarez. And then previously, before that, in the round of 16, Man City took down Leipzig 8-1, seven goals in the second leg, and they beat Bayern Munich 4-1 in the quarterfinals. So Man City are advancing to their first Champions League final since. But this was back when I liked this team. 2021, their 1-0 loss to Chelsea. That was my first game as a Chelsea fan. I remember I was like, Pulisic plays for this team? (laughs) That's their only previous Champions League final appearance, by the way. So this is just their second ever. The (laughs) Citizens, is their name, are one of 20 clubs who have been to a Champions League final but haven't won it. Can you name all 20 of Adams? <laughs> no, no. I don't think so. But three other clubs have been to multiple and haven't won. That's Atletico, who have been to three, Rimes, who have been to two, and Valencia have been to two. Manchester City are also one of four English clubs who have been to a Champions League final but lost it. So can you name those other three English clubs and Adams who have been to a Champions League final but haven't won? Um, Manchester, no. They've won it. They've Manchester won United it, won. obviously. Arsenal? Yes, 2006 is their only appearance, and they lost. Arsenal, um, you said three other? Two others, two more. Yeah. Arsenal, um... Big, big Arsenal rival. West Ham? No, from four years ago. Another Chelsea, another London team. Um, oh, we talked about them. Chelsea, New, no, Newcastle, all there. Um, um, give me, where did they end in the league this year? What, like eighth? Eighth. Tottenham. Yes. Because we beat them. Um, yes. And one more from 1975. This oh team God. made their only Champions League final. It wasn't called the Champions League back then. It was something else. Maybe like Villa. Still... What about Aston Villa? No. no. It's a team who finished very low. Very low this season. Southampton. No. Oh. Um, no. You're Bournemouth? very close. Very close to Southampton. Not Leicester. No. Not Leeds. Yes, Leeds! <laughs> 1975. That's Leeds United crazy. made the final of the European Cup, whatever it was called, and they lost. And you know what? They ain't getting back anytime soon, let me tell no. you. No. <laughs> oh, that was rough. These are facts. And then we've got Inter. Inter Milan, who become the first club from Serie A to appear in the UEFA Champions League final since Juventus fell to Real Madrid in 2017. So it's been six years. The last Inter team. By the way, I got another question for you, Adams. Do you know the last Italian team besides Inter to win the Champions League? And it's not Juventus? It's not Juventus. Oh, you'll remember this one well, let me tell you. AC Milan. It's AC Milan. 2007, they beat Liverpool in the Champions League final. Jamie Carragher was probably playing for them. But in 2000, the year five, right? We beat them in Istanbul. No, no one remembers. Like, 2007, they, everyone remembers. Were they going on <laughs> but Inter actually won. They were the last club to win the Champions League for Italian clubs because they beat Bayern Munich. That was back in 2010, though. So it's been 13 years since an Italian club. And by the way, it, Serie A was the only league to have teams in all three European Cup finals. Champions League, Inter, Europa League, Roma. Conference League Fiorentina. Wow, that's impressive. How about that? Serie A back on top? As someone who was just in Italy yesterday. Oh, <laughs> for Christ's sake. Um, the whole atmosphere. 
everyone is so excited. Like everyone is watching soccer. Every like jerseys, people are wearing jerseys literally everywhere. Is that not normal? It it was just like more like hyper. Like we would talk to everyone and they were like, Oh my gosh, like we're big inner fans, like we're so excited for the final. We met someone who's going to Istanbul for the Champions League final. Um wow. like it was just it was crazy. He he was like showing us all he went to the um semi against AC Milan and he was showing us all the videos and like was like, look, like this is like they're a bit like the uh, Red Devils, because when they play like home and away, it's the same stadium, but one's like it was the really San cool. Zero. Yeah. That's pretty cool, bud. But very fun atmosphere. How about that? But as I was just about to say, it just so happens that the two Milan clubs who share the San Siro met up in the semifinals for the first Champions League Milan Derby. Do you know what it's called in Italian? No. The Derby della Moldenina. Wow. I probably said that wrong. Yeah, probably. But first Champions League Milan Derby since the 2005 quarterfinals. But, um,. If you watched it, it was pretty clear from like kickoff who was the better team. And even Raphael Leo was didn't play not in one the of first, them. He wasn't in the first leg, so everyone yeah. was like, second leg, he's coming back, we're going to win. No, it was very clear. It was a one sided game. 3 0 on aggregate. So, so Inter advanced to their sixth final overall. So you've got. Manchester City and Inter Milan. And for Manchester City, you've got, of course, their manager, Josep Guardiola, Pep Guardiola. I, I got confused. Like, when I watched the Champions League before and they showed him and they showed his name, Josep Guardiola, I was like, who is Joseph? Yeah. But that's <laughs> his real that. name. I didn't know that. It's, Pe- it's Pep. Pep Guardiola, is a, he's looking to win his final major trophy at Manchester City. He's won everything else except for... The Champions League. He's previously won the Champions League, though, with Barcelona in 2009 and 2011. Then you've got Inter Milan's manager, Simone Inzaghi, who has never been to the UEFA Champions League final as a player or a manager. He managed Lazio in Italy from April 2016 until summer 2021, which is when he went to Inter. So it's his first time ever at the Champions League final. But when you talk about the two teams, of course, you got Manchester City. No surprise who was at the top of the scoring sheet. That would be um, Erling, who netted 36 goals during Premier League play this season, which is the most goals in a season in the history of the Premier League. This is true. You know, whatever. You know. <laughs> Harry Kane, actually, Harry Kane scored in 26 matches this year, which is tied for the record with Andy Cole from Newcastle back in 1993-94. And, and that's like Tottenham even had a bad season and Harry Kane still breaking <laughs> records. And then Phil Foden was second. He had 11 goals. You don't like Phil? No. He plays for your country. He's, I don't know, not a fan. He's had his same haircut for I know. all his life. <laughs> Terrible haircut. Um, <laughs> and then... Julian Alvarez netted nine. That's for a Premier League. For the Champions League, Holland had 12 goals. And then Alvarez and Bernardo Silva and Riyad Mahrez all had three each. That's just insane, though. Like, you don't play that many Champions League games. And he had 12 goals. Uh, he's not. He's a whole different human. Uh, and then for Serie A, Inter were led by the World Cup winner, Laturo Martinez. He had 21 goals. Lukaku who we don't like on this podcast, had 10. Because right. he used to play for Chelsea? Yeah, and he was terrible, and he would just stand there, give me the ball, and then he'd turn around, shoot it in front of 12 people. He is rumored to be dating Megan the Stallion, though. So. Oh, God. You heard it here, Emma's facts. That's impressive. Um, and then Eden Dzeko had nine. Dzeko actually led Inter with four goals in the Champions League, and Martinez, Lukaku, and Nicolo Barella all had three. So, Bud, we took all that stuff, put aside. Both these teams have already clinched Champions League play for next season. Man City already finished the top of the Premier League. Inter finished third in Serie A, along with Napoli, who won the league, which was pretty cool, Lazio, and AC Milan. So, Bud, it's time to make our predictions. 
we've got, uh, well, I think I know where you're going with this, but um, Man City on DraftKings are minus 475 odds. Inter are plus 330, which means, if you don't know, City are very heavy favorites to win. And Adams, who you got winning Saturday's Champions League final? Here it comes! As much as much as I would love to see Inter Milan win, like for so many reasons, too. I think it's probably going to be a landslide for City. And that is not, that's not trying to sell Inter Milan short either, because they're a great team and they've, you know, they've made it far in their, in their own league and this season, like it's a big accomplishment. But at the end of the day, like if you put anyone against this Manchester City team, it's going to be heavily favored towards City. Like there, it, it's nothing personal. If it was, an, if it was every team, I would say City. The only team I would question is Real Madrid, and they beat them. So yeah. So yeah, I think I'm gonna agree with you. I think I'll take. I uh, listen. It'd be awesome if Inter won. Like that'd be one of the biggest upsets in a while. But uh, I think I think I think Erlen Holling is probably gonna score. So. I'm hoping for a Lukaku masterclass. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> Lukaku. No, no, thank you. So, if you want to watch the final, it is this Saturday, 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern in Istanbul on CBS, Paramount Plus, and Univision. But the pregame show starts at 1.30, and I will be tuning in for the pregame show, <laughs> let me tell you. Another reason for everyone to want Inter Milan to win is because which is, I found this out for Men and Blazers. Men and I Blazers, love, please yes. let us on, on your show or <laughs> well, you should, or God, partner with us. Don't beg. Please partner with us. Um, Quit whining. It's because some, some city fan already got a tattoo of the treble. Like, he <laughs> already tattooed. <laughs> 2023 treble champions, Manchester City, with the three trophies on his leg. Oh, no. Oh, so no. everyone, please help Inter Milan win, and so all city fans can be embarrassed. Thank you. That's just. I mean, why? Why would you ever do that? I mean, he literally <laughs> jinxed it for everyone. Why would you get a tattoo before it happened? <sighs> or at least keep it quiet so we don't know. <laughs> I now you're gonna be like, "Oh, we're under pressure. This man yeah. got a tattoo." No. no before we move on, though. I feel like we should give a shout out to the, the <laughs> this is weird, but the television network that is airing the Champions League final, CBS. I said the pregame show starts at 1.30, which you're going to want to watch because that studio show that they have, might, it might be the best studio show like in all of sports. Kate Abdo, Thierry Henry, Jamie Carragher, Micah Richards. Like, I don't miss a second. Like, it's amazing. I love them. I love oh them. Gosh. And you know what? What CBS has done, I think, for soccer in America has been awesome. Not just the Champions League. Not just the fact that they put the Champions League final on big CBS, like, with the biggest reach in the country. They put midweek, like, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, they put midweek games on CBS. They have Serie A on Paramount+, Plus, which they do a really good job with. They just started this Golasso Network, which is the only 24-7 soccer network in the U.S., which I was watching this morning, of course, because mess they were talking about Messi. And it was like, that's awesome. Like, compared to, well, NBC has done a really great job with the Premier League, too, so not including them. But, like, ESPN and Fox, who do okay. But CBS has blown them out of the water. Like, they do an amazing job. And this has only been the past few years that CBS has even gotten into this. Like the growth that they've made is incredible. But also, yeah, like you said, NBC, NBC, obviously they, NBC Universal owns Peacock, which has been a big branch of watching the Premier League. And um, like right now, Peacock and Paramount Plus is like where you watch soccer in the US. So mm -hmm. it is, you know, another streaming service. But it is really good. And they've got more soccer we're going to talk about in a little bit. Oh my gosh. Get ready. Moving on. We've got big transfer news to talk about, Adams. Because yes. um, 
we have to start with the GOAT. The greatest, maybe, of all time. There's others, you know, Pele, nerds on Alexis but... McAllister. No. It became official on Wednesday, Emma Adams. Lionel Messi, one of the greatest active player, one of the greatest to ever play the game, is coming to the United States. Not just to chill and hang out, but to join Inter Miami in MLS, as was first reported Tuesday night. Then we had the big time reporters on Wednesday. Guillaume Balaguer, Fabrizio Romano, here we go. We got the here we go. I mean, that was official. And then Messi did an interview with Sport and Mundo Deportivo in Spain, where he said it himself, I'm coming to Miami. Can you believe it? Emma Adams, I mean, this is huge! America! I mean, oh guys, gosh. you really... Everyone needs to be thinking about this, because this man is, is one of the legends... And he just finished his time at PSG. And he really said, not only am I going to go to the MLS, but I am going to go to the worst team in the MLS who are currently ranked 15. Uh-oh. So he, the, the money and the deals this man is about to be making is brilliant because I would do it too for a check. We would all do it for the check. Like, you don't need to be a billionaire to make the, you, to see that it's clear. But, I mean... Well, listen, I, if he wanted the check, he'd go to Saudi Arabia. He's still making a check. Yes, he's that's true. Check. So, it's, it's crazy. I don't know where Inter-Miami is getting... The, I don't know where any club is getting this money. I don't think I want to know. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of... You know, Inter-Miami may be a club, but, you know, there's also MLS. And there's also Adidas. And there's also Apple. And all the league partners. So all that money's not coming from Inter. But listen, there was an offer from Al-Hilal in Saudi Arabia, which was reportedly as high as three years, $1.6 billion with a B. And he said, no. Which... Why would you want to live in Saudi Arabia? Like when you're already when when you're already a billionaire and you're like one one point six billion to compare to however many millions he's making in the US and he gets to live in Miami and gets a bunch of brand deals that'll probably end up making one point six billion anyway. So it's Listen, like y'all. <laughs> Florida may be garbage, but it's at least better than Saudi Arabia. Might as well be tan and <laughs> be in fancy Miami as well. So, the only other option Messi had though was his longtime club of Barcelona in Spain. Like, I don't think people realize he joined them when he was 13 back in 2000 and he stayed there for 21 years. And he probably would have gone back if Barcelona weren't idiots. Like, they did, they have all these financial troubles. They can't, they couldn't get a deal done. And Messi was like, I'll read you some of the quotes from his interview. But like he was he was probably going to go back there. And they just I don't know what's wrong with them. Well, here, let me. So he did that interview with Mundo Deportivo Wednesday, June 7th in Spain and a bunch of the quotes. So I'll just read a bunch of them here for you. He said he said, quote, if it had been a matter of money, I'd have gone to Arabia or elsewhere. It seemed like a lot of money to me. The truth is that my final decision goes elsewhere and not because of money. Unquote. But with we Barcelona, all know it's because of money. Well, that's funny. He also said regarding Barcelona, quote, I really wanted to return to Barca. I had that dream, but after what happened two years ago, I didn't want to be in the same situation again, leaving my hands in the leaving my future in the hands of someone else. I wanted to take my own decision, thinking of me and my family. I heard reports of La Liga giving the green light, but the truth is that many, really many things were still missing in order to make my return to Barca happen. I didn't want to be responsible for them to sell players or reduce salaries. I was tired. Tired. I love to be close to Barcelona. I will live in Barcelona again. It's already decided, he says. I hope to help the club one day because it's the club I love, unquote. He goes on to say, though, quote, I received bids from other European clubs, but I didn't even consider those proposals because my only idea was to join Barcelona in Europe. With Barca deal collapsing, I wanted to try something different now in Miami, 
quote. And then, you know what, Barcelona decided to put out a statement, which read in part, quote, um, President Joan Laporte, who is the president of Barcelona, understood and respected Messi's decision to want to compete in a league with fewer demands further away from the spotlight and the pressure he has been subject to in recent years, unquote. Disgusting! I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, well, what, are you going to trash him on your way out? Like, bro, Inter Miami is going to be a bigger club than Barcelona in 10 years. Whoa. There's no pressure when you're already the bottom of the league. They are. They're 15th. In Eastern Conference, they're second worst in entire MLS. LA Galaxy is behind them. LA Galaxy. They have 15 That's points. Sad. I know. They just fired their manager, Phil Neville, brother of Gary. They lost to DC United last Saturday in Miami, or in Flor- their stadium's in Fort Lauderdale. By the way, their stadium is like really small. Like they're planning to open a new stadium by the airport, but a lot of this, like, the tickets are going to go crazy. Like they could put, they could put the games in Hard Rock Stadium, which is where the Dolphins play. You know, seventy thousand seats or whatever, and it would sell out probably. No, it would not. Oh yes, fun. No. Yes, it would. People are going to go crazy. People who don't care about soccer are like, I'm going to go see Messi play. Like, and not in a stupid friendly. Like, this Premier League Summer Series, I'm sorry, y'all. It's stupid, okay? I'm not paying $100 a ticket to go up at the rafters of FedEx Field to watch Fulham play Chelsea. And it's not even their A team, it's their C team. Like, Yeah, Pulisic's not going to play. He's not going to be there anyway. I'd rather pay... Well, I paid... Listen, y'all... I am going to the DC Miami game July 8th. So, Messi, if you are listening, July 8th, I know you probably aren't going to play, but even if you just went. Or be there. Or be there. But if you just went there, Messi, I would love you forever. What are you talking about? You know, if you want to do that. But, like, I'd rather pay, however, probably four times as much now to go watch Messi in an MLS game that's actually competitive and not some silly international friendly that we have in the summer. So you know what? I think they could sell out Hard Rock Stadium. Because a lot of people, let me tell you, Adams. No, like in Atlanta, you know, Atlanta United plays in Mercedes-Benz Stadium where the Falcons play. They're going to open up the upper level. Charlotte FC plays at Bank of America Stadium where the Panthers play. They're going to open up the upper level and they're probably going to sell out. So we'll see. we'll see. They will. I'll bet you like a million dollars. Deal? Deal. <laughs> a million dollars. They will. Let me tell you. But you talk about the messy deal. MLS has these weird salary and roster rules. So it's kind of, you know, junky. But they got help from Adidas, who makes the kits for MLS. A- Messi's an Adidas athlete from Apple, who, listen, Apple broadcasts MLS exclusively beginning this year. We talked about it on this podcast. MLS Season Pass is their new subscription service, which I did a podcast on like a little bit ago. Around the world, like England, Italy, China, and the US, you buy MLS Season Pass. That's the way you watch Apple. You know how many people in Spain, in England, in France, or wherever are going to buy MLS season pass because they want to watch Messi. No, it's not going to be zero. It's going to be a lot of people in the US too. So Apple's like, you know what? That sounds like a pretty good idea. So they're going to get a lot of money. And he'll reportedly receive an option to buy a stake in an MLS club once he retires, which is what David Beckham did, if you don't remember. David Beckham, he took his talents to LA Galaxy in 2007. He exercised that option to Get a stake in Inter Miami. True that. And you know what? We saw those pictures like a week ago of David Beckham at PSG in France. What do you think he was talking to Messi about? Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. So you know what? That could be awesome. And you know what? If people buy MLS season pass, then they can watch the other 28 teams too. 29 when San Diego joins in two years. Listen, y'all, it's going to be amazing. Here comes a fact. I will make the claim right now that today, Wednesday, June 7th, the day of recording this podcast, 
is so far the biggest day in the history of soccer in the United States. Wow. Until we win, you know, Copa America next year in the World Cup in three years. But for now, biggest day in the history of soccer in the United States. Truly believe that because what Messi is going to do is he's going to, people are going to watch Lionel Messi. People who don't even care about soccer are going to watch him at Miami. And people are going to be like, oh my gosh, this game of soccer is pretty cool. There you go. It is, M. Adams. It is. It's really cool. It is. I mean, gosh, I'm so excited. We have to move on, though, because we have other stuff to talk about, including some other transfer news. Jude Bellium, who plays for Dortmund, a previous Liverpool target, is heading to Spain to Real Madrid for a reported $120 million plus transfer fee, signing a contract until 2029. Why are you crying? That is so much money. (laughs) Yes, it's not as much money as Messi's getting, but... No, but, like, that's why... The, what would MLS do MLS have caps on their uh, like money? Like talent? the salary cap is four point nine million. Yes, wow. but yeah. it's all the roster rules are so weird. Like he's not getting the bulk of his money from Inter Miami. He's getting it from Apple and Adidas. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but yeah, obviously not many clubs confront a hundred and twenty million on one player. So. Fenway Sports Group cannot. Oh. No, no, we have no money. Uh, well, no money. $42 million for Brighton's World Cup winner Alexis McAllister. Confirmed with a here we go from Fabrizio Romano. I heard 35. Maybe euros or pounds or whatever. Sterling, yeah. Well, it's for you transferred over. It's $42 million. But for one player who is a World Cup winner, we that means we have 80 million more. So to spend before we even hit the Jude Bellingham limit. Uh, but you love Jude plays for England. I do, bro. I love him. He's best friends with Trent. Uh, well, why didn't it happen then? You know, I bet Trent was trying to front the transfer himself. He probably said, look, <laughs> here is $100 million cause, but they just wouldn't let him. Not the best negotiator. Lives with his mom, you know. He does. Humble, it's true. Humble beginning. Humble beginnings. Uh, okay, but you also talk about Madrid. They're also reportedly very invested in another English star who we talked about, Tottenham's Harry Kane. And if Harry Kane isn't available, Kai Havertz is reportedly another option. You know how I love my King Kai. Guaranteed. Oh my gosh. All right. King. He won. He scored the goal in the Champions League final. They won because of him. Two years ago. He's a great man. The king. Oh my gosh. Speaking of Chelsea, Ingolo Conte is leaving England for Saudi Arabia because he is joining Al Idihad for over $100 million. Real Madrid's 35 year old Karim Benzema is also joining that club. He's going to earn nearly $200 million per season for the next two years. And Ronaldo's, of course, there too. But by mm-hmm. this. Uh, why would you want to live in Saudi Arabia? I mean, gross, <laughs> like gross. Like this all seems like, remember a decade ago when the Chinese Super League was trying to buy all these old players? That's what it seems like. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's not, it's not going to catch on. Ronaldo, shut up. You don't want to be there. Okay. You're just getting paid a lot of money. And there's, there's rumors that Suarez might leave for Inter Miami as well. Suarez um busquets like a bunch of Messi's friends and um they fired their manager as i said they're trying to get i believe tata martino who was the atlanta united manager when they won mls cup in 2017 also the manager for mexico back you know world cup but yeah you he could probably they could probably listen they could they could still make the playoffs and because mls cup has playoffs you know yeah, like and um, can like the top nine teams make the playoffs in the conference? So interesting. They could still win the league, but I mean, so that's all the transfer stuff. Now, finally, let's go to what we're all excited about. M. Adams is really excited right now. U.S. Men's National Team. America. Oh my gosh, our beloved U.S. Men's National Team 
They're back in action next week. The CONCACAF Nations League returns. It's the big one, y'all. The CONCACAF Nations League. Y'all remember two years ago? That was basically... Well, I think we had you on previously. But two years ago, in June 2021, that was like our big introduction to the wonders of the U.S. men's national team on this podcast. Because I think... That game against Mexico in the CONCACAF Nations League final, which was 3-2, extra time thriller, Pulisic penalty. Pulisic! Buries it in the upper 90! Ethan Horvath saves a penalty in like the 128th minute. Guardado from this spot. And he's denied! Horvath with the save of his life! That was like what turned me on to soccer. And you know what? It was amazing. And that was where we got our big introduction on this podcast to the U.S. men's national team. This year, though, that was the first ever edition of the CONCACAF Champions League. This year is the second edition, and the U.S. play Mexico in the semifinals. And Panama and Canada also play in the semifinals. Winners of those two matches are going to play in the final. Losers get to challenge themselves in the third place game. So the semifinals are on Thursday, next Thursday, June 15th. Panama, Canada is at 7 Eastern. U.S. Mexico is at 10 Eastern. The final is then going to be played Sunday, June 18th at 8:30 p.m. Eastern. Third place game kicks off. Before that, at six o'clock, all those matches are going to be played at Allegiant Stadium in Nevada, which is home of the Raiders in NFL. And all those matches are going to air on Paramount Plus. Another shout out. So, M. Adams, how many goals are the U.S. going to beat Mexico by? Zero. What? Did I lie? Yes. They're going to beat Mexico. This is like the worst Mexico team in 30 years. Okay, then I'll go with 2 no. Very good. Oh, Dos Acero! We love a good Dos Acero. Dos Acero! Dos Acero! Dos Acero! Dos Acero! And then... I think they'll probably play Canada and they'll beat Canada. And you know what? CONCACAF Nations League winners again. Congratulations. By the way, the UEFA Nations League finals are also being played next week. Semifinals are next week. Wednesday, you've got Netherlands, Croatia, Spain, Italy the next day. Both those matches kick off at 2.45 Eastern. Those games air on FS1. The final is on Sunday, June 18th at 2.45 p.m. Eastern. That airs on Fox. Where is England, Emma Adams? Who's going to win? Uh, Netherlands. Really? Mm. Yeah. With Virgil. And Cody Gakpo. Debatable. Nations, CONCACAF Nations League's the real big one, though. I mean, that's the one that counts, you know. <laughs> well, England, you know, where are England? Like, why are... Uh, I, I hear all this stuff about England are so much better than the U.S. But you know what? We were the better team in that nil-nil draw in the World Cup, I believe. Pulisic was like an inch away no. from Pickford. And then we make the Nations League semifinals. England doesn't. Wow. Aren't there more teams in the Euros than the CONCACAF? Oh, no. CONCACAF has like 100. Because all those little tiny islands in the Caribbean are their own country and their own team. But they're not, like, every team in the Euros is good. Canada's bad, Mexico's bad. That's two out of... <laughs> Costa Rica, Panama, Honduras, El Salvador. <sighs> Listen, England has never played on a cow patch in the rain in El Salvador. The U.S. have to do that. <sighs> I would like to see England do that. Trent would break his ankle, Harry Kane would start crying, Jordan Pickford would just be screaming at the Missoulas. He, it would be, it would be a disaster, let me tell you. Well, I'll tell you what won't be a disaster is when England play Malta next Friday for our Euro qualifiers. Thank you very much. Wow, how many goals? How many goals are we going to score? Nine. Brilliant. 11. I would like you to know that we have won all of our Euro qualifiers so far. One against Italy, 2-1. One One against Ukraine, 2-0. A war-torn country. Those were the only two we've played so far. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) Two teams that didn't make the World Cup. 
Uh, but Italy, you said Italy's in this final that you said where England is, but well, we, apparently Italy, Italy plays so well in European competitions and not international competitions. Well, I don't know. Cause they can't do that. Well, if they are not going to qualify for the euros, cause we just beat them. So they'll qualify for the euros. They'll be okay. But uh, basically we play Malta next Friday. And then three days later we play North um, Macedonia. So. Big hoping time for, clubs. Hoping for two dubs, so then we hoping. can qualify for the Euros. I feel like that would be an utter embarrassment if they weren't 5-0 at least victories, though. So. You'll be excited because uh, we play Australia hmm. in October. Oh, the Socceroos! I love the Socceroos. I know you do. Let me tell you. But I'm not done with the U.S. men's national team because, listen. I was. Well, I don't care. Nations League, they have got the CONCACAF Gold Cup after the Nations League, which takes place, it begins June 24th. It's played in the U.S., as it always is, because CONCACAF doesn't want to post it anywhere else. I don't think anywhere else could host it in, you know, our region. The final is played on July 16th, though, just before the beginning of the Women's World Cup at SoFi Stadium, which is home of the Rams and the Chargers in Los Angeles. The U.S. is going to face Jamaica, Nicaragua, and a team TBD in the group stage. Nicaragua, let me tell you, Jamaica, tough teams. Qatar is also in the CONCACAF Gold Cup um, for <laughs> money. And of course, Panama, Canada, Costa Rica, Mexico are among the other notable teams. And all those matches are going to air on the Fox networks later in the summer. It's probably going to be the B team for the U.S. or C team. Just like it was two years ago. But you know what? We still beat Mexico's A team. So you know what? Give me a break. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. They are. And then, bud, there's also the manager situation for the US because uh Ugh. I know you love what's his name? Southgate. But we didn't really love Greg Berhalter. His contract ran out after the World Cup. Anthony Hudson, who was the former New Zealand manager and Colorado Rapids manager in MLS, he was the assistant, he was an assistant at the World Cup. He was the interim manager for the first half of the year until he departed because he, we found out on Tuesday, he loved Qatar so much during the World Cup, he's decided to move there. He is the new manager at Al Markaya in Doha. Listen, well, he, got the, he got the bag. I mean, he got the bag. He got the bag. Ugh. So now we have a second interim manager. B.J. Callahan, who was also an assistant under Burr Halter. He's never been a head manager, though, for a major club. He was assistant for Philadelphia Union, though, for five years before he was assistant for Greg Burr Halter. But Callahan has been confirmed to manage the team during the Nations League and the Gold Cup. So, listen, if we could beat Mexico with our second interim manager, listen, man. The U.S. need a little help about finding me well okay let me tell you i got an explanation for why this has happened okay because okay. i know you remember all the geo reina drama yeah well so the director of football or the sporting director ernie stewart he left back in january to become the director of football at psv eindhoven in the netherlands mm -hmm. matt crocker who was the former southampton director of football operations was hired back in april he won't start full time until August, though. So they're still, you know, but they need a sporting director and they got one. So now they have to figure out, you know, a manager. He also, though, oversaw Southampton's Academy from 2006 to 2013, oversaw the development of players like Gareth Bale, Alex Oxlade Chamberlain, Luke Shaw, James Ward Prowse, you know, okay. guys who are pretty good. He, well, Oxlade Chamberlain just got sold. <laughs> whatever. He also has some international experience. He joined the FA, England's Football Association, in 2013. He was the head of teams coaching, working with then under 21's manager, Gareth Southgate, and then a director of elite development, Dan Ashworth, who's now the sporting director at Newcastle. And during his run overseeing the youth teams, he oversaw the under 15 through 20 teams through 2020. The U17 and the U20 teams won their World Cups in 2017. The U19s won the Euros that year. 
So, you know, he didn't do a bad job, even okay. though England is, you know. And in The Athletic, when they did their write-up about Crocker, they wrote, quote, sources who have worked closely with Crocker describe him as the perfect fit for U.S. soccer because of his experience in building up sporting infrastructure and implementing a strategy and culture, unquote. So, you know, perfect fit, M. Adams. We'll but see. They, they still have to find a manager. It yeah. could be Jesse Marsh, Leeds. It could be Jim Curtin, who's the Philadelphia Union manager. Greg, it could be Greg Verhalter again. It could, it could still be. Ulysses, like, okay. Matt Turner was sitting next to him, though. He was like, really? But, you know, there's also Jose Mourinho, who might want to leave Roma. If Pep, if Pep Guardiola wins the Champions League, what, what would he have left? In... Manchester City, no. Fun. Come, have fun left. Come do what Messi did and have fun in America. We got the most talented roster ever, Emma Adams. We have two major international tournaments being hosted in the U.S., Copa America and the World Cup over the next couple of years. So I, you know, Pep, come on. Just say, come on. You know, wouldn't that be good? I think. Let's do it. Well... <laughs> Jose Mourinho is too passionate to be a U.S. manager. I love that man. Let me tell you. He's funny. If I, if I speak, I get in trouble. <laughs> if I speak, uh, I do not speak. I. <laughs> I prefer really not to, um, not to speak. If I speak, I am in in big trouble, in big trouble, and I don't want to be in big trouble. Uh, and then Pep, Pep, greatest, one of the greatest of all time. I mean, Pep coached Messi. Don't you think they're talking and he, Messi's like, it's really fun over here. Come on. Well, I don't think so, but we'll see. I do think so, though. Messi isn't know. even over there yet. He will be. Listen, <laughs> you know, the NBA finals are in Miami. He could, if he goes courtside to a game, let me tell you. Oh, my gosh. Which are tonight, Wednesday. That's too soon, though, right? Well, he could fly. True. All right. Let's wrap up, though with some transfer talk for the U.S., because we have to talk about the U.S. We talked about Pulisic. He needs to leave Chelsea. The reports say Premier League or Serie A. So then there was Newcastle, who in the winter were reportedly interested. They're no longer interested, apparently. AC Milan was one of the clubs named by Fabrizio Romano for Pulisic. Um, Juventus, it could be another Premier League club. I don't know. But he, he's got to leave. Like, he needs to leave Chelsea. Like, that's... Automatically, yes. Yes. It's the truth. Serginho Dest, who was at AC Milan this season from on loan from Barcelona, is reportedly linked with Germany's Union Berlin, who are going to play in the Champions League next season. Of course, he's still signed with Barcelona. Man, he could have played with Messi. Maybe we'll go to Miami. Newly minted him. Oh, bud. Have you heard the name of Florin Balogun? Yes. Really? He, listen. He is an American, yes? Not an Englishman. He chose America. This 21-year-old legend chose America I think those two add over <laughs> England because Gareth is a dummy. Because he knew he could start and he couldn't start in England. Oh. How old? Harry Kane is not 21 years old. Yeah, exactly. His experience. You know, he, the U.S. love him. He said that all the comments on his Instagram posts of American flags and saying, come to America, helped persuade him. No England flags. No one saying, come we don't to want the him. three we don't lines. Need him. Oh, you don't need him. Ooh. Oh, 2030, you'll be talking differently when Harry Kane is in a nursing home and Florin Balogun is winning the, his second straight World Cup. Mm. Right. So he was at Rimes in France this year. He scored 21 goals, which was fifth most in the league. That was a fact. He, though, has ended his loan, and he's back at Arsenal. Reports are mixed, though. Some say he could leave. Others say he could stay. But if he goes, the two Milan clubs are highly linked at the moment. So, listen. That man, you're going to watch him in the CONCACAF Nations League. 
play against Mexico. Oh my gosh, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, screw Harry Kane. I love this guy. I mean, come on. <sighs> oh, watch. He, he's an American. America. <laughs> And then we got another U.S. striker, Ricardo Pepe. He may be on the move because he's 20 years old. He was on loan from Augsburg in Germany at FC Groningen in the Netherlands. Groningen finished last in the Netherlands League. They only had 18 points this year and they Ooh. got relegated. But Pepe scored 12 goals, had three assists. Both were tops on the team, which tells you how bad they were. <laughs> they're, they're bad. but. He's back at Augsburg now, but he impressed some of those clubs. So the top two teams this past season, Feyenoord and PSV Eindhoven in the Netherlands, are both reportedly negotiating for his services. Interesting. And Feyenoord are going to be playing Champions League next season because they won the league. PSV are going to have the opportunity to qualify for the Champions League later this summer. How about that? And then you've also got Leeds United States. Are you done? We got the trio. Medford Messi, Brendan Aronson, Tyler Adams, I love, Weston McKinney. I love all of them, to be honest. McKinney, though, was it was just a loan move from Juventus. That ended, so he's back in Italy. Aronson and Adams, though, are still with Leeds, who were, of course, relegated. Although, for Tyler Adams, a move back to the Premier League appears more and more likely because right now the teams currently linked are Forest and Manchester United. We'll see. And, of course, I told you he had 89 tackles in the Premier League this season, fourth most in the league while playing in just 24 games. <laughs> like, you know, he could be loaned or sold. Aronson, I don't know, probably the most likely to stay. Reports say that a loan move could be possible, especially if Jesse Marsh ends up somewhere. True. I don't know, we'll see. Speaking of Jesse Marsh, though, the wrongly fired Leeds United manager has been the subject of the rumor mill already in Adams because reports say that on the international side, he's one of the favorites to land the job of his home country, which is obviously the U.S. We'll s I don't know. We'll see. On the club side, though, he's reportedly among the top contenders for Monaco and France. Listen, I would love to go to a game in Monaco. Yeah. And Celtic in Scotland, both clubs who are looking for new managers. And then I saw today that there's reports that say Ajax who finished third in the Netherlands this year, 13 points behind Feyenoord in first place. They may be interested in Jesse Marsh. People realize, M. Adams, that it was not Jesse Marsh's fault that they got relegated. People realize that it wasn't his fault and that he's a good manager. He managed Erling Holland in the Premier League. I don't know if you remember this several years ago. Erling Holland was playing for, did I say Premier League? Champions League. Erling Holland was playing for Salzburg. Salzburg came to Liverpool in the Champions League, and you know what? Took him to the brink. So I think that Jesse Marsh may end up at Manchester City, but you know what? <laughs> There's that connection, let me just tell you. I don't know. But I did. I don't know if you all follow Xander's facts on TikTok. Same as Bog. I did make a recent TikTok highlighting the disaster that Leeds United were once Jesse Marsh left. It had all those stats that I had in there that I mentioned earlier, so you know. Go check it out. I'm just saying. Where's he going to go, Adams? Mean, I'd love for him to go to Monaco. That'd be really cool. I'd like to live in Monaco. That would be nice. I don't know where he's going to go. Probably to a club, though. I don't see him going international anytime soon. Well, if he's offered the U.S. job, he's not going to say no. Like, and you know what? They may offer it to him, so. <laughs> Depends how. You never know. You never know. I guess not. So, that's basically all I got, bud. We are going to do another podcast next month, right? Yes, Women's World Cup. The Women's World Cup. We had the Men's World Cup back in the winter. U.S., you know. But, listen, our stars and stripes, our ladies looking for their record fifth star and a third straight Women's World Cup victory in Australia and New Zealand. They're not going to get it. Listen, bud. Oh, really? No. Who's going to then? England. Really? Don't England have, like, injuries they have to, like, they're they losing do. people? Someone, like, broke their leg. Well, you can't play soccer without two legs, so, you know. The U.S., though, in their group play Vietnam, Portugal, and the Netherlands, which is a 2019 finals rematch. 
And the other top contenders that I found are England, Germany, Sweden, France, Spain, Australia, Canada, and Japan. So, you know. Exactly. But uh, there's one true contender, and it's the team that's won four Women's World Cups. England has won how many? Zero. Thank you very much for the answer. Oh my gosh, I'm looking at the times. 5.30 a.m., 4.30 a.m., 7 a.m., that's great. So, okay, we're, the U.S. play, I believe, Portugal at 3 a.m. We're streaming that game. Okay. Yes, yes, 3 a.m. Eastern. Seriously? <laughs> okay. But their game's against Vietnam and Netherlands, I believe, are at 9 p.m., which is, you know, that's not bad. So, But anyway, we're going to talk about that more later, how the women are going to win, the U.S. women. The Women's World Cup begins on July 20th. All the matches through the final on August 20th in English. They're going to air on Fox and FS1 in Spanish, Telemundo, Universo, and Peacock. So, bud, we had a lot of soccer facts. Well over an hour's worth of soccer facts. A little bit. But you know what? It was... They're all important. Too many facts. Any, any final thoughts? We, I mean, we truly picked... A great day. Like we don't come out with podcasts on Thursday, but we did it on a Wednesday this week. We're recording, and it, it was worth it. And let me tell you, we didn't know Messi was going to do this. Mm-hmm. Wow, a truly momentous day in soccer across the globe. And Adams, just your final thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see the rest of what the summer holds in regards to everything. It's a big year coming up for sports and soccer. So so much MLS. I mean, listen, Messi, <laughs> DC United, July 8th, please, Messi, be there. Oh my gosh. Please. All right. Ev Adams, once again, our Xander's Facts soccer guru. Thanks again for coming on the podcast, sharing all your facts. Thank you so much. Xander's Facts. Oh, yeah. Thanks again to Emma Adams for coming on the podcast, our Zaders Fact Soccer Guru. We had a lot of facts to talk about on the podcast this week, y'all. A lot. We didn't, first off, we were going to record this podcast on Wednesday and come out with it on Thursday, as I told y'all last week at the end of last week's podcast, just to warn y'all, because we usually come out of podcasts on Wednesday. And <laughs> we had no clue the messy news was going to drop on Wednesday. So it was kind of perfect timing. But. I will reiterate that today is a huge, one of the biggest, if not the biggest days in the history of soccer in the United States. This messy move is going to be massive. But those are all the facts that I have for y'all on this week's edition of the podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. Remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, episode 108, rate and review the podcast, then check us out on all the socials. We got Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Xander's Facts. That is Xander with a Z. And most importantly, remember to tell all your friends. We like to call it Spread the Facts. Xander's Facts Podcast. Tell all your friends about the podcast, about the newsletter, Xander's Weekend Facts, about Xander's Facts on YouTube. All of our new episodes get posted to YouTube, including this one with a nice background. You can watch it. So nice. Subscribe and check out the Xander's Facts link tree. It has all the Xander's Facts links that you need. So that's it with episode 108, episode 109. Of course, more facts are coming up next week on the usual day, on Wednesday. So be sure to tune in on our regular day, Wednesday, June 14th, for the next episode of the Xander's Facts podcast. But that is it. That is a wrap on episode 108 of the Xander's Facts podcast. Thank you all so much for listening, and we'll see y'all with episode 109 next week. Thank <laughs> you.